From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, blue chip recruit ratios, crowds, labels, historical perspective. All that on Wake Up War Champ, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com is the website. You can also hit that QR code. takes you right to the site. Check out the daily lunch special as well as the social calendar. Thursdays, bingo nights. It's still going down even with the Independence Day kind of rollicking through our, our week, do you think, Corey? I should probably check with our guy, Bill, but I would assume they're still going to bingo it up tonight. Of course, yeah. That, isn't that what the forefathers would have wanted? Yeah. I mean, it's not July 4th, it's July 6th. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, of course there's going to be bingo, buddy. Got to yeah. make money. That's right. Got to go win some money, and then there's uh, live music on Saturday, like I said, July 8th. So uh, hit, the, hit the corner pocket if you want to hear some good music, have some cold beer and some hot food. Speaking of making money, I assume since you're here right now, you didn't take down Biloxi. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. I, I never, I never do. I don't. Again, I don't bet enough to ever have a big weekend. Hmm. You know, some of my buddies will have huge weekends. They also have huge losses. Yes. Um, I kind of wave the middle where I never, I never have horrible losses, but I never win. Right. So it's pretty fun. I feel like I'm pretty lucky, all things considered, in my life. Got a good kid, healthy, yeah. uh, have a really fun job, have a wonderful fiance, uh, have a pretty cool ex-wife, uh, all that stuff. I, I feel like I've, I've, I've been lucky, yeah, had a good yeah. life. But when it comes to gambling, geez, Louise. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I guess that's the uh, – I mean, I guess I'd rather have my life and be bad at gambling than be pretty good at gambling but be a mess outside of it. You know what I'm saying? Well said. Yeah. So, you know, I guess I still got to thank my lucky stars that I have the life I have. But it uh, I do get tired of losing um, at blackjack all the time. <laughs> uh, you can be winners alongside us here at Warchant.com, as I mentioned on a couple shows here. We have obviously have the great support of uh, our great friends over at Corner Pocket Bar and Grill and Vitamin Energy. But our YouTube channel does a lot of cool stuff, uh, whether it's the Warchant Wrap, the Warchant Report, revolving door of talent through that programming. Uh, you can put your name on it and uh, be involved with us. So reach out to myself, Aslan at Warchant.com. You can tweet at me, Aslan Hodges, which I need to come up with a new name. I'm, I'm going to try to get at Aslan on whatever Mark Zuckerberg is launching later today, his his Twitter knockoff, just in case everyone starts migrating over there um, because I'm just sick of the Aslan Hodges thing, and I've never sat around and think about what I should rename myself. But I digress. Corey, yeah. Warchant.com, our employer, the ultimate symbol of sports. Hit the thumbs up, five-star rating and review. We've got a big mailbag. Let's get to it, shall we? Let's do it. We will begin with Dstrad09. He's got an interesting avatar. Let me blow this thing up. Uh, just this gnarly beard, big toothy smile. Maybe not that cool. Anyhow, with Mike Norvell on the cutting edge of roster management, not just recruiting rankings, how likely is it that this team shocks the nation with the overall talent? No team has ever won a championship without at least 51% blue chip recruits. So I think that means what, like four and five star? I guess that's what blue chip is. Mm. Um, even with adjusting for transfers, Florida State still sits below this threshold. They are at 41%. Is this the beginning of a new era in football where experience matters more? I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's hard to know because the sample size is too small because we've only been living this life for a couple of years. Um, but in this blue chip ratio uh, roster uh, gauge is what's Jared verse. What well, he, does he count as? He did say with adjusting for transfers. So I would, I would hope. But I don't that, know what that means though. I, I don't know if that means like, are you a, is, is Jared verse a four star, a five yes, star? Is Braden would, Fisk a four star? I would, I would imagine. Yes. But again, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of this stuff comes from other networks and we, you know, it gets cross-pollinated. We we don't have the metrics and we don't have the sort of maybe philosophies they have. But carry on, Corey, sorry. Well, I guess I would say, like, it just seems like they would be closer to 50% than that. But, um, look, I know the national championship game was in, was just a diabolical. <laughs> but, but TCU, what was their blue chip ratio? And they were four quarters away from winning a national championship. And I can promise you, 
Florida State has more talent than that TCU team did. And that TCU team got into the playoff and won a game. So, and I don't, you know, obviously it went sideways very quickly against Georgia. But, look, man, they weren't that – Georgia wasn't that much better than TCU. It was just one of those days, man. It's like that – there was a national championship game. I think it was the Michigan team that beat Florida State in the Elite Eight. And then Villanova beat them by 40 or whatever it was in the national championship game. Like, Villanova wasn't that much better than Michigan. They just had a great – now, granted, Georgia was better than TCU. And Georgia was going to win that game. But, I mean, you know, TCU got to got to that championship game. I certainly think Florida State's roster is strong enough and good enough and talented enough to be in the game, be in the national championship game and probably wouldn't lose by 58 points if they got there. Hmm. So uh, I, I do think we have to start reevaluating how we look at these these rosters and not start. We already have. I certainly do like. Again, I just look at recruiting rankings completely different. I know Florida State had a great weekend and it got, or I guess it was on the weekend, week holiday, and had some had some recruit had some recruits commit. But you know they're gonna they're gonna probably contribute in 2025 at the absolute earliest. Meanwhile, there's a transfer or five out there right now that'll be very important players for your 2024 team that you've never heard of or don't even know about. Um, so the point being. I don't know if it's going to be a shock because I think Florida State's going to be close to the top five in the preseason polls. But yes, I, I think the transfer portal has opened it up where th- these these blue chip ratios, you're always going to want to, again, you're going to want to recruit well. The, the more four and five star kids you get, great. But you might be getting four and five star kids from other places. They might not be guys that sign with you out of high school. And I think you can, I definitely think you can win a championship the way Florida State has constructed its roster this year. They don't have the they don't have maybe the depth of a Georgia or an Alabama or an Ohio State, but that's where the line stops, right? Right. Like you know when we always compare Florida State, we do this on headlines all the time too. We're comparing them to the big blue blood schools that have all this talent. It's always those three, right? And then we're done. It's not like and then and then Michigan and then Florida and then Tennessee. Texas. You, yeah. you you stop. Right. It's Georgia and Alabama and Ohio State. Yeah, you're not on par with them from a recruiting standpoint nationally. Your roster isn't loaded with four and five star talent that are young guys like those 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 teams are lucky enough to have. But that's it. There's nobody else like so. Th- there's only three of them out there. You can get in the national championship game with the roster you have, and you also have a quarterback that I think is better than what TCU had. I think you have a defense that's more talented. You have NFL players all over the field, in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah, I think you can win a national championship with this team. That was a very long answer. I apologize. Let's speed it up. Um, you know, I, I pulled up a depth chart on a website that doesn't know about this program, but let's just humor it real quick, Corey. Okay. Let's just, I guess, maybe let's go to offense. Maybe that's not fair. We can go through the entire thing. Johnny Wilson, yes, blue chip. Keon Coleman, blue chip. Yep. Whoever's starting at slot receiver that's not Van Dravis Jacobs, probably not. Um They've got Bless starting at left tackle, probably not. Uh, Darius at guard, he was not blue chip. Maurice was not blue chip. Casey Roddick, I would say, if you're going to adjust it for transfers, that's a blue chip. So that's three. Jeremiah Byers, that's four. Uh, Jaheim Bell, that's five. But also, Demetrium, Jordan, well, I'm saying Jordan Travis, six. Trey Benson, seven. So but seven Demetrium of your 11 Emmanuel are blue was, chip. But Demetrio Emanuel was an all-conference player last year. Right, and, he's, and on this depth chart, they list him at second string. So if you want to put him – over to say Darius Washington, who they have left listed at guard, and you put uh, Dimitri over him, which that's totally reasonable. That moves you up to eight out of eleven guys are blue chips. Yeah, now, in the, our minds, right? In well, our no, in I think in minds. anyone's mind, man. I think listen, if you adjust it for the way they've played and performed, like I sure. can't, I can't say Winston right right now is because he's coming off. If right. last year I would have said it, but coming off injury, I can't really say that. Darius Washington probably hasn't played as a four star. I mean, he's, he's done versatility. He's fine, yeah. he's middle of the road defensively. Patrick Payton. Yes. Fabian Lovett. Yes. Yeah. Fisk. Yes. Verse. Yes. So that's four out of four. Deloach. He wasn't a blue chipper. Right. Um, Bethune wasn't a blue chipper. Fentrell Cypress. Yes. You can you can adjust. So there's five. Akeem Dent out of high school was blue chip six. Uh, Shaheen Brown was not. Uh, Renardo Green was. That's seven. And then Greedy Vance was not. So you got seven out of 11 on defense. So we 15 out of 22. Yeah, that's you know, and I know that's not maybe the entire roster and you're not going to go through the entire year playing only these 22 young men that we just listed. But 
Um, I take umbrage made with the percentage. There is enough talent to win a national championship. All that said. Next question. Yeah, yeah let's question. do it. <laughs> Noel Boy 2 Hey, guys, wake up. What's the most underrated crowd in Doak history? Thanks for all you do. Hope you enjoyed your Independence Day. Support the sponsors and go Knowles. I saw this beforehand. I'll go first, Corey. I'll give you some time okay. maybe to, to ruminate on this. Um, he's asking for underrated, so I'm really reaching for this one. I was there, and I don't know how many people listening to this show are there. We don't, I feel like we're not strong enough in the 38 to 42 age demo, which I think would be the people that like went to college around my era. You're either okay. seemingly a lot younger or a lot older than that. But anyhow, if you were there, I think you might remember this, everybody. 2003 Georgia Tech game. Huh. Really cr- random, crazy game. I should have had the box score pulled up to talk about this, but I know they were trailing at some point, like I think in the fourth quarter, maybe at the they end of the third not, going to the They were trailing fourth. 13 to 0. Yeah. They had gotten shut out through three quarters. Yeah, it was against it was, a pretty mediocre Georgia Tech team. It was bad news bears, but that crowd really did come alive and man, I don't know maybe because I was a little bit lubricated and I was in the student section and I you know, it was like the cheerleader. I was like the uh, I was like the the, the the yell leader at like at, like I was at A&M like I was just like getting everybody coordinated and orchestrated to like yell at the right time and everything. But man, that, that crowd that stayed because some people left because it was pretty ugly for a while. Uh, the, the, the brave ones who stayed, I think impacted that game and helped Florida state pull out a win. So I'll, I'll pull the 2003 Georgia tech out for this one. It's a good answer. Uh, I, w- I was going to say about that game. I have a friend that's a Georgia tech fan and he was in the seat. He, he came down and watched the game with us from my dad's seats. And I remember Georgia tech was up. What were they up? Six to zero. Well, really, uh, in the fourth quarter. It's a very, very exciting game, everyone. <laughs> Go back and try to find it on Instant Classics if you can. <laughs> and uh, they score a touchdown with like they hit, they rip off like a 50 yard run or something to make it uh, to go up 12 to zero, and they kick the extra point. And I think this would have been uh, I don't remember who I don't think it was Paul Johnson at the time. I don't think he was there in 03. No, uh, it was Shane Gailey. Gailey. Yeah. yeah. And I remember telling my my buddy was all excited, and I remember saying, "Why wouldn't he have gone for two? And he's like, "I don't know, I don't care. It's you know, it's thirteen to zero, and they lost fourteen to thirteen, yep. Yep. and they gave up two touchdowns in the final six or seven minutes. I think Rick's at PK Sam yep. for the game winner in that one, mm-hmm. and uh, and yeah, that's a good that's a good choice. That was uh, that was the year that was supposed to be the year that yes. Florida State was back. Yes. And then they went up to North Carolina and beat the bejesus out of the, a horrible North Carolina team on national television. It's where Greg Jones knocked um, Dexter, uh, Reed. His, Dexter Reed's helmet off. And then you're like, man, this team is loaded. We're back. And then the next week, of course, <laughs> I think, or two weeks, whatever it was, they're getting shut out at home by a bad Georgia Tech team. But they, hey, still got 10 wins that year. Yeah. Still, yeah. still made some. I'm going to go back even further, Aslan, because we're the old guys. Yeah. I'm going to say 1990 Virginia Tech. Ooh. And if you know, you know. Okay. But Florida State got down 21-3 to in that game. It was the week before Miami. This was before Virginia Tech was thought of as any good at all. This was 1990. It was like Beamer's third or fourth year there. They were huge underdogs. And they were winning 21-3 to in the second quarter. And then Brad Johnson, before he got replaced by Casey Weldon, he was still the starter, led a comeback. T-Buck had a uh, really incredible interception return for a touchdown. And then even late in the game, Virginia Tech's only down by four and they're driving. And then they fumble a ball. Errol McCorby picks it up and runs that in for a touchdown, and they won the game. But that was a really exciting game, and the crowd was uh, was really fired up for that one. But there's a million of them. Yeah. There's a million great dope dope games. Yeah, let's go with underrated ones that we don't you yeah. know, talk. We don't talk about. You know, everyone talks about Oklahoma, Notre Dame games. Uh, yeah, so the '98 year. Florida game is probably the loudest I've yeah. ever heard it. But there, yeah. there, yeah, but '96 Florida, yeah, there's some great ones in there. What about 2018 Boston College? You know, I'm glad Willie got that moment. He never heard Doak loud. He, he heard it at the spring game, his first spring game, and he heard it when he ran out on the field before the Virginia Tech opener. And then it was basically uh, you could hear needles, pin drops for the rest of his tenure there, except for an occasional boo. But he did get the Tamori and Terry long touchdown against Boston yeah. College. So it was cool he got that. It's a good choice, Aslan. It was a good pop. It was a good pop. Uh, ruthless underscore gaze. I think I, I probably should have bundled this, but we'll go with it. it's my fault. Corey, I love your articles. It's actually the main reason I subscribe. So thank you for your insight and wit. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for saying that. Aslan, you're all right, but I can get your stuff for free on YouTube and podcasts. <laughs> is, that, is that really what it says? It says you're great, too. Uh, oh, okay. Just, all right. Just wanted to be a little more self-deprecating. Uh, Thanks, Ruthless Gaze. Appreciate you, man. Great job as usual on the article. 
you, Corey, about game experience of this year's team. When I see teams that have a lot of returning draft eligible players, I wonder if the reason they return is because they're not good enough to go pro. With that said, I do think many of FSU's returners could have been drafted this past year, but not sure how many, uh, or rather how much of my view is distorted by having garnet and gold glasses. I imagine with NIL, we will see more high-quality players return in the future. Yeah. I can't wait to see how the season plays out to see if older, experienced three, four-star guys can beat out younger, unproven, high four-star and five-star players. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you know, you, we've always seen it in basketball where there'll be, you know, Kentucky, Calipari's been there for, I feel like, two decades now. And he's won, literally, and I think he's won one national championship. And he has it been two decades. We got, it's I mean, got to be close, right? Well, what was the Derrick Rose year? Because he was at Memphis. Oh, that yeah, year. that was like 08. Yeah. No, when did Derrick Rose win? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been like 15 years. I think Derrick Rose was his last year there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, when can- they lost to Kansas in the championship year. So he's been there 15 years. He's had probably the most talented team all 15 years. And he's always littered the first round of the NBA draft with Kentucky players all the time. But they've only won it once, and they've lost to less talented teams all the time. Now, basketball is different than football, clearly. But I do think we're going to be in a new wave of this sport because you are going to see more guys return to school than you ever have before. Now, the guy, like running back should always go. If you're draft eligible, go because you have a short shelf life. But everybody else, if you can come back, make some money, improve your draft stock, then I just think you're going to see a lot of these te- a lot of these players that are like second or third day picks, not rush to go get drafted. They'll come back, make some money, some real money, and then go take their chances the next year. And I so I think it'll be really interesting to see Florida State. This Florida State team will be a great uh, case study in how these how these programs build their rosters in the future with, with NIL here now. Like how this comes out, because again, what I've talked the beauty of NIL. What what what's awesome to me is the kid from Purdue, the basketball player, that's seven foot fourteen or whatever he is. He's a huge yeah. dude, Eady. Zach Eady. Yeah, yeah. he's the be- He was the best college basketball player in the country. He was the runaway Naismith Player of the Year. He averaged like twenty and fifteen, but he won't play a second in the NBA probably. It's just not the same game. He won't be able to – they'll they'll make they'll, – they'll run him off the three – I mean, he just – it's the, the game is so different there with all the shooting. He doesn't really have a spot in the NBA. But he has the luxury of coming back, making a lot of money at Purdue. And, may, I mean, they were a one seed this year and got bounced in the first round. But maybe they make a run next year with him. And they're going to be experienced and blah, blah, blah. The point being, I do think that, that older, more experienced teams with – Third day draft picks will have will now have a much better chance of beating the younger teams with first and second day draft picks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I think those two years that from nineteen to twenty one or from eighteen to twenty one, man, those make a those a huge difference. Yeah. And yeah, if Florida State plays Ohio State or if Florida State plays Georgia, Georgia has more talent than Florida State, but they don't have a ton of experience. And I just, I mean, I just think that matters. I think grown man strength is a thing. And I think a lot of the Georgia guys are 20 years old and a lot of the Florida state guys are 22 and 23 years old and they're all good. So you have, you give yourself a fighting chance as opposed to without NIL, Jared verse probably leaves. Johnny Wilson probably leaves. Trey Benson might've left. Jordan Travis probably leaves, but now you actually have a fighting chance because all these guys have come back. They get some money and they have a chance to go win a championship. And they are good enough. They are not all first-round draft picks, clearly, but they are NFL players, and some of them are just very good college football players. And, you know, that's what that's the sport they play is college football, so that matters the most. You know, I guess we could do a, an entire podcast on just this one kind of question alone, though, Cord. But, you know, when he, when he asks, I can't wait to see how the season plays out to see if older, experienced three-star guys can beat out younger, unproven, high four- or five-star guys. Like, is Jeremiah Byers better than Julian Armella right now because it was a bad evaluation on Jeremiah Byers coming out of high school? Was Jeremiah Byers three years ago better than what Julian Armella is now? Or is it that experience? Like, is it bad evaluations that make these these experienced three-star guys really that much more valuable than they, they were originally? Or is it the fact that they have gone through 
three, four years of a college strength program, even if it is a place like UTEP. And, and that's why they're, they're much better poised right now uh, to, to contribute. Yeah, I think and we, we all know that offensive line is the hardest position to evaluate, especially out of high school. And I just think a lot of times you get a guy like Jeremiah Byers that's undervalued. I, I don't think he went to a big time high school and then he gets into a college strength program for the first time. And sometimes people just explode physically once they actually know what they're doing and get the proper uh, training. And, I, and, and maybe take it more seriously. Maybe realize, okay, this could be a career. And things click. It just happens. And I think Jeremiah Byers is a great example of that. And Armella probably, not probably, I think he does have more natural ability than Jeremiah Byers. And I think Armella might end up being awesome. But, yeah, no, he's not as good as Jeremiah Byers right now. But Jeremiah Byers is 23 years old and has played 40 games of college football. Julian Armella has played two. And none meaning no meaningful snaps. So yeah, I think it's experience, but I also think for those guys that are under the radar a little bit that come from the UTEPs, Jared Verse too, man. Like what happened to Jared Verse? Right. Like where where did that come from? You know, he was a guy that got, barely got recruited at all. It, it went to Albany, and now he's going to be probably a first round pick. Like it just sometimes bodies develop slower. Sometimes a body takes differently to college strength programs, and yeah, I mean. I don't, I don't know how it happens, but it happens all the time. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's cool now. One of the one of the downsides of the portal is that there's, you know, you don't, I mean, it's, it's a freeway where everybody's going 100 miles an hour passing each other. But Jeremiah Byers does get a chance to go play at Florida State. So does Jared Verse. Like, they outplayed their recruiting ranking. They outplayed where they were, where they were uh, you know, three years from, three years ago. And what everybody thought of them. And now they get to play on national television against LSU, buddy. What a great life. That's right. Make your life better with Vitamin Energy. Go to VitaminEnergy.com. Use a promo code WordChampBogo, B-O-G-O. Buy one, get one free. All of the Vitamin Energy benefits are packed in one convenient shot. It helps you achieve a healthier physique. Just look at Corey Clark. There's zero sugar, zero net carbs. It's keto-friendly, so it supports weight loss. It's convenient to drink. You can carry it with you everywhere. No sugar crash because, again, no sugar. It supports your immune health. Seven hours of energy and more. Tastes great. Fast-acting. Healthy nutrient metabolism also in effect when you take this little 1.93 fluid ounce shot. And you get it for free when you use the promo code WARCHAMPBOGO. Buy one, get one free over at VitaminEnergy.com. When you use that promo code, Vitamin Energy, shake it, take it. You'll like it. Back at it we go, Corey. Uh, DB Chief, as we seem to have put the worst five years of modern Florida State University football in the past, I have to wonder what we will call this bygone era. We have a tendency to refer to periods of FSU football when talking about the past. We had the pre-Bowden era, the early Bowden years, the dynasty years, the lost decade. What do we call 2009 to 16? Uh, what do we call 2017 to 2022? Thanks for all the content during these slow days of summer, gentlemen. Oh, rock bottom. Uh, let's hope. Uh, yeah, I think 9 to 16. I think it'd be 10 to 16 is how we'd phrase that. The Jimbo years. Right. And everybody knows what that entails. Because most Florida State fans, obviously, I think all Florida State fans, not most, appreciate the heights he reached. They do not appreciate the the, 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 the fire that he left. Yeah. But they do appreciate the heights he reached. So when you say the Jimbo years, it's all encompassing. It includes the great heights. It includes 29-game winning streak, Jameis Winston. It also includes what, 38-3 to three loss to Boston College, and him and challenging a fan to come down and fight. And then lying to us and telling us he wasn't going to take the job after the Florida game or telling us we're just doing it for clicks. And then two days later, he takes the A&M job. So, uh, so yeah, it all, we all know what, the, what that entails. But from, yeah, from 17, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Rock bottom doesn't even do it justice. Because I don't even know. It's probably not rock bottom, is it? Rock bottom was still the Mudra years. Right. They went right. winless in a, in a season. So uh, I was trying to think of like something like the, the era of tumult or like the, the vacuum era because there was just so much change because you lose Jimbo, you get Willie, you lose Willie, you get Mike, you're dealing with a pandemic, you lose your athletic director, your longtime, you know, your consigliere and a guy like Monk Bonasort obviously mm. passes away. 
Um, Andy Miller, you know, the, the leader of Seminole Boosters who helps fund everything before the NIL era, uh, you know, steps aside. So that there's so many moving parts. It's just like we need to figure out some clever name just to talk about just like the, the turnstile times or something, um, that 2017 to 22 era. Uh, workshop it, everybody. We're well, yeah, somebody come up with something. I just know it was awful, and I never want to go back there. It was gross. Right up until I asked Norvell the question, yeah. that Monday press conference, and since then it's just been nothing but rainbows and puppy dogs. You're welcome, everybody. That's what we do at War Chant. Remember, remember who loves you. Remember who turned around this program. War <laughs> Chant. Yeah, it was Corey. I mean, I, I shouldn't have said you're welcome. It's all of us, Aslan. Yeah. Look. The we, the royal we. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's all of us. It's all of us at War Chant. But, yeah, it was mostly me. But still, it's all of us. I, I, I'm a, yeah, I'm a team player. What, what I love is that what has continued to go viral and, and live on throughout this remains my standard definition video version of that press conference. <laughs> right. When like the university films in full HD and everybody else has, you know, they got cameras or camera phones, which the audio is not that great, but. Uh, we film in standard def so we can get things up as quickly as we humanly possibly can for all of you. So it's, it's just kind of funny that, like, there's so many different versions you, people could have probably used. But, like, that tweet, that video is just – it's lived on. It's lived mm. on. And uh, it's going to be – I would say it's going to be part of a Gene Wojciechowski college game day segment. But RIP, Gene, part of the uh, ESPN layoff. So whoever is the new Wojciechowski, uh, Rinaldi – uh, that will be used at some point this upcoming season in the college game day segment. I can almost I, – I can see yeah, it. I don't going. think there's going to be anybody left on set but Pat McAfee. <laughs> Do you think – you think he feels bad at all? Like McAfee? I think McAfee is a – seems like a genuinely good person. Yes. A good dude. Yes. He's And he's very good at his job. He's funny. Um, he has that twang, but he's very articulate. He's intelligent. He knows how to talk to players. He knows how to talk to people. But – Holy moly! Like they pay, they're paying that guy a huge bathtub of money every day. Meanwhile, Pollock's out of a job. Wojciechowski's out of a job. Jeff Van Gundy is out of a job. I mean, what is going on? I, I didn't know ESPN was struggling that much. They can pay Pat McAfee a hundred million dollars a year, but I mean, I, so I wonder. Do you think he feels bad at all? Probably not. I guess it's just a business. I, I was thinking that about that too. I, I. Uh, yeah, man, because I, I to your you know what you were saying about him, he does seem like a genuinely good human being. So I mean, there's like a natural like, dang, like you know, it's part of the business. But you're like, man, you know, like I wish it didn't have to be this way, but it, you know, I want to do what's best for me, so I kind of have to. I mean, that, yeah. there's a little bit of it. I don't know how much he might have lost sleep, or you know, maybe one of his naps was a little bit interrupted. But then he got back to <laughs> sure diving through his pools of cash like Scrooge right. McDuck. Um, shout out though, yeah, I mean, game day is still it'll look you know somewhat similar. Um, Island Chief, wake up. Happy Independence Day. Uh, yeah, what did you – so did you shoot off any fireworks, Corey, or you just spinning, playing pie gowns? No, no, I was at – we were in Biloxi still, but oh. we got a room on the 28th floor of our casino, Ooh. and so after dinner we went the back bow? there. Were you at the bow? No, that's where we went to dinner, oh. and then we went back to uh, the IP because I had a free room there. Oh. And um, and uh, so, yeah, we went up to the 28th floor, though, and it was it, our window was out towards the bay, and we got to see the, the bow fireworks. Nice. And we got to see them all over the bay and all over the neighborhood between the IP and the bow, which isn't a great neighborhood. They're, but they were shooting off fireworks. It was still fun. They, everybody was still celebrating the 4th. It was a cool view. Mississippi Coast, underrated. Very mm. underrated part of this great country of ours. Yeah. Amen. All right, so here you go, guys. With the clock changes this season, fewer plays. Are the season scoring and offensive records going to be like when baseball went from 154 to 162 games? Will this be a new era in college football? Over a 13- or 14-game season, that's close to two games worth of plays. Well, yeah, but they're going to they're be less plays. Uh, I see what he's saying, but the 154 to 162, for people that don't know, when Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's record for home runs in a season, they put an asterisk by it. Asterisk. I can't ever say that word. No, I can't. Um, because he did it in, like, game 161, and Babe Ruth only played 154. Um, uh, but this will be a little different because there will be less plays. Like, I back, you know. There, there, there won't be a, I would assume the average number of plays for an offense will go down probably four or five a game. So I don't know if, uh, but yes, just in this particular offensive era and the fact that you're right, there's two or three extra games played for some of these teams. I don't know though. I don't know what records are, are out there. 
number one, who really cares about college football records, like season, single season records? I don't know what they are. Yeah. I think Barry Sanders has the rushing record. No. I'm and sure I don't know, I don't know like, that that would ever be touched. It's sort of like Buffalo probably broke it. It's one of the Wisconsin guys, I feel like. Every year it's like know, Ron man. Dane broke the record, then Monty Ball broke the record, and then. Well, they were all rushing for 2,000 yards, but I, I think Barry Sanders ran for like 2,600, something ridiculous, and 39 touchdowns. It was. Go back and look at those. I mean, obviously Barry Sanders turned out to be a pretty good running back in the NFL too. But go look at those records for his one year and holy moly. Oh, yeah, no, you're looked, right. What Melvin Gordon in twenty five eighty seven is in second place. Barry Sanders twenty six twenty eight. I feel like that's safe, right? Twenty six hundred yards. Yeah, no one's running. Yeah, yeah but I mean, you. Melvin Gordon wasn't that long ago. He got to twenty five hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing. So Barry Sanders, I think, did probably did his in twelve games. Because they, no, they might have played an extra game that year, actually. they I remember when he won the Heisman, he wasn't at the ceremony because they were getting ready to play some game in Japan. Not a bowl game, like a regular season game, b- bizarrely. Um, so, I you know, so maybe they played an extra game they that played year. But, 12, yeah. They played 12 games that season. Total? Yeah, they were 10-2, and two, apparently, according to a college football reference. Oh, you know what, though? I, I Back then... I'm almost positive what he did against Wyoming in the bowl game didn't count unless they've retroactively go back, go back and add those because back then bowl games didn't count towards your single season stats. Mm. So anyway, to answer the question, I don't even remember what the question was, but yes, I, I would think with more games being played, even though there'll be less number of plays, the more games will add to more. You, you would think, especially passing, passing records or receiving records being broken. And we should look at them a little differently than, than, um, You know, Lawrence Dawsey was unbelievable in 1990. He had an unbelievable season. He didn't get to 1,000 yards, but he might have been one of the two or three best receivers in the country. I think he finished real crazily at 999, but he was awesome. And if he was playing in this day and age, I think that's a 1,500-yard season. For what it's worth, still over on College Football Reference, it, it lists him as playing in 11 games, although they went 10-2. and two. It shows him playing in 11 games. And the year prior, he played in 11 games as well. So mm-hmm. maybe maybe that's the way it's reflected. Like, you're, you know, they don't count the bowl game as a game played for your individual statistics, as you mentioned, because uh, that's not the way they used to do it back in the day. So I want to tell you, folks, I just want you to understand, there's, there might be, not be another podcast in America outside of Stillwater, Oklahoma, <laughs> That remembers, number one, that Barry Sanders wasn't at the Heisman ceremony. He was in Japan getting ready to play a game. I think against Houston. I don't remember, but they won, and he had a huge game, as always. And then they also played, their bowl game was against Wyoming. And, of course, he ran wild against Wyoming, too. Crushed it. Crushed it, everybody. Is that right? Did you look that up? I don't know about Houston. Um their last game of the season was against Texas Tech. Oh yeah, in Japan, and then that's right. So I was, hey, I got the state right. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, how far is Houston from Lubbock? Where are they just right down the road? And then, yeah, they play. So that's right. So the Wyoming game, whatever he did again, that Wyoming game didn't count towards his season stats. Yeah. Which is crazy. Let me try to pull it up, see what he actually did. Box score, not friendly on this website. Well, we did. I'll we're try not- you. We're not wake up cowboys, but yeah, go ahead yeah. And get, if you if you want to, Corey. You go. You ask the next question. I'll uh, look it up. PCB Nolman, can you provide an overall assessment of Coach Josh Storms and the Florida State Strength and Conditioning Program? How do we compare to Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State? Thank you. Uh, Barry Sanders rushed for 222 yards and five touchdowns in that game. That's it. So yeah, so he ended up he ended the season with 2,850 rushing yards and 42 touchdowns, but the 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 222 and five against Wyoming didn't count. Gotcha. Yeah, this is a tough one to compare the overall. I mean, I don't. We don't see the raw numbers of what Florida State's guys are lifting, nor do we see what Alabama and Georgia are lifting. I mean, all we can really look at are, are the rosters and the heights and the weights, and they're closer. They're much closer to that than they they were. You know, they look the part now. That too. Uh, yeah. so, some of it is because they've 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 had 22 year old dudes transfer in. Uh, Casey Roddick, Jeremiah Byers, Keandre Jones, Braden Fisk, Daryl Jackson. Like, these dudes are dudes. They are big college football players. Yeah. They look like a top 10 college football team lineman is supposed to look. But so do the guys they recruited. They're getting – Josh Farmer looks like that. Yep. You know, Patrick Payton isn't there yet, but he's getting closer and closer. These linemen they brought in, Armella, they, they look the part now which is part of – that's half the deal. And then, of course, they got 
genetic freaks on the outside of wide receiver. So they, I, but, but again, go into the strength. I wonder, like, I don't even know how you would judge it as far as like, you know, how many guys bench over 400, how right. many guys bench. Over, is that even a thing? Do they even do that anymore? Yeah, I mean, they still do the, you know, the compound Olympic lift. So they still do, you know, bench, squat, and then, like, your cleans. No, I know they of... do it, but do they max out, and do yeah. they care? Yeah, yeah, I know they do, man, because that shows okay. your, that shows your your progress, you know, makes them feel better, hypes them up and everything. And, they, yeah, and you, you know, you're not going to blow out your pec doing that. All that stuff's like, you know, urban legend, urban myths and stuff like that. You know, and they're, they're so much more – you know, in tune with flexibility and mobility too. So they're but it they're used to be back place. in the day, right? Like in the eighties, yeah, in seventies. It was uh, other yeah. than the guy in Nebraska that started yeah. everything. It was just basically, hey man, lift up that bench, lift up that, lift up the bench press, do the dar- do the dumbbells, yeah. you know that kind of stuff, leg press. But there's so much more. There's so much different training now different parts of the body, more explosive, that they don't do it like, hey, just max out once a right, week. Right, right. I think they're working on a number of different muscles and body movements, and it's not just the the blockheads going into the weight room and like Ogre from Revenge of the Nerds. Right. It's a, there's a reference for everyone. Mm. Go watch that movie. Great movie today. Really holds up. Not at all problematic. And I feel like, I don't know, soft tissue injury-wise, they're doing okay. Like, there's, there's not like a plethora of, of crazy, wacky injuries kind of happening to them, which a little bit of it goes back to the way you're warming these guys up and focusing on mobility and what you're doing in the in the weight room. So that's always a good kind of thing. Um, when it comes to that, don't you think, like, to me, like a, like a soft, a lot of the soft tissue stuff, it's not like these – these guys have a uh, a blueprint, a, a secret blueprint on how to stretch. It's it's up to the player to stretch correctly. Yeah, but you put them like, through this. Like, don't just go through the motions. Well, listen, like when I would when I went in the weight room like two years ago to do that story that we ran, like when they come in there, like they're put through the paces to like warm up properly before they actually get under a bar. So. And then when well, they when they warm up before practice, obviously we're there. The war chance playing, and they're going through their warm up line. Like, yeah, it's, you need to make sure that they're on top of that stuff. Like yeah, but player I'm run saying, practice like it's wise, stuff's a little more. Th- and I meant more the player. Like, you don't want guys pulling hamstrings or no. or, or everything else. But basically, hamstrings. What you're, but it's up to the player. Like, it not you can't look at all eighty guys and be like, are you really, really stretching that hamstring? Like, it's up to the player to know his body and to know to really stretch it. And not just go through the motions. There's only so much a trainer can do when, and I'm just talking about preventing injury. Right. Like if the person doesn't take stretching seriously, and I say this now as a trained fitness professional, mm. you 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 might you're gonna have more injury. So you got to get the guys to buy into actually caring about their bodies, which it seems like all these guys do. And save for the LSU game, they did pretty well in the fourth quarter. Like I I wonder if I went and added up like their scoring margin in the fourth quarter. Like they they didn't wear her down late in games. So in terms of like endurance, stamina, yeah. uh, they held up well. You know, obviously they outlasted Oklahoma and Florida, Louisville. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So uh, these are all part of uh, you know components that go into. It. We'll see. Maybe one of these days we can maybe get some raw numbers. We're in the throes of summer, everybody. Not a lot of live sports going on out there, but you can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, including the future. Over at mybookie.ag, be sure to use the promo code WARCHANT for an instant cash deposit bonus if you sign up for the first time over at mybookie.ag. The Knolls getting two and a half against LSU. That's right, LSU's favored by two and a half. Florida State plus two and a half. We're going to take our Knolls, and look at this. It's ballooned. It's swelled up for Florida State. They're now plus 2,000 again to win the national title. So that means if you were to bet 100 American dollars on Florida State to win the entire thing, you'd win 2,000 American. So check that out. You can also bet on the Home Run Derby. You can also jump into their live casino if you got the itch at a certain time of day where there's nothing going on live sports-wise. Because, again, it's summer. Wimbledon, I guess. We'll get that to another episode. Check out mybookie.ag. Be sure to use the promo code WARCHAMP. Mybookie.ag. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere. A few more questions here. Uh, let's go to random underscore John. Uh, good morning, Aslan and Corey. Hope you both had a wonderful holiday and that you still have all your fingers mm. present and accounted for. Yep. Thank you, John. What exactly is it about Mike Norvell that makes him a coach who goes from believing in a one-legged Mackenzie Milton being the best option and having little trust in Jordan Travis to turning Jordan Travis into a possible Heisman candidate? 
Well, he is a, he is a Heisman candidate preseason, so he's, he did it. He's not possible. He is a Heisman candidate. Uh, what did he not see then that magically showed up a year later? It's not like Travis didn't know how to throw a forward pass. Was Norvell not putting effort into Travis back then versus now? Look, I, I think um, if we could give him truth serum, what's that called? Like sodium pentothal? Bam. Pentothal, yep. something like that? Pentothal. Um, if you – if you gave him truth serum, I think his biggest regret since he's been at Florida State uh, is that is, is what he the, how he coached the quarterback position, the decisions he made after the uh, Notre Dame game, because it cost him Jacksonville State. It cost him his almost it cost him rock bottom, his all time most embarrassing loss. Um, and he's lucky that Jordan Travis is the type of player he is, because then it could have cost him his career, like legitimately, like there is a world where Florida State goes 1-11 in 2021. Half the team leaves. Jared Verse doesn't come here. And then they go 4-8 and eight last year, and he's out of a job. Like, all that was on the table. And I'm not saying Jordan Travis is solely to blame, but there are a lot of quarterbacks, there are a lot of lesser people that when they get booed on their home field are done with four and never rebound and never regroup and never have the Miami game in 2021. It never have the season they have in 2022. It never happens. Jordan Travis is a very strong kid mentally. And Mike Norvell, quite frankly, didn't do him a lot of favors with the way he handled him after the Notre Dame game. Um, and you could tell. And so my point being, if you went back five years from now, if Norvell's won two national championships, Jordan Travis has won in a Super Bowl, um, and you could talk to both of them, specifically Norvell, and ask him honestly, I think he would admit that was his biggest mistake and that he let – the fans kind of dictate who he put at that position because he knew he could not have known. He could not, not have known that McKenzie Milton couldn't do it. Like the, the problem, the worst thing that happened to that football team, it almost derailed his career was those throws McKenzie Milton made when he came right into the game in that, in the fourth quarter against Notre Dame. Like if he throws an interception on that first pass, instead of an incredible throw, then Travis goes back into the game. They lose it. They probably lose anyway. But then the next game, they beat Jacksonville State, I think, by three or four touchdowns, and they get to a bowl that year. Yeah. But they didn't. McKenzie Milton had a couple of really nice throws, two or three to be exact, but they were incredible throws, better than any Jordan Travis made that night. Then they do this crazy they, – they, then they, they, they're, they're hush all week about who's going to be the starter – McKenzie starts, Jordan Travis plays Summit tailback. They give Jordan Travis some reps at quarterback for one series. It's a three and out. He gets booed. And then he rides McKenzie Milton the rest of the way, which is a which was a huge coaching error. And so um again, I just think he's matured. And he and he and I think maybe, hopefully, that was the last time I feel like he's a young coach and you're gonna make mistakes. And he's never been on a stage like this. He's never he had never coached in a game that more people watch in that Florida State Notre Dame game. And when he saw McKenzie Milton make those throws, he's like, "Well, man, maybe everything I'm seeing in his practice is wrong. And when the lights turn on, this guy is awesome, and I'm going to ride with him." And then he did it the next week and he lost to Jacksonville State. And so, I just think he made he made a miscalculation. I don't think it, he changed maybe as a person, but I think at that point he he I hope he said to himself after walking off that field, I'm not going to let fan pa, uh, uh, the fans' choice be my choice. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna ride what they want. I'm gonna let Jordan Travis be the quarterback. He was the, he, he won the job in the August. He, he's better than McKenzie Milton, and that was dumb for me to have McKenzie Milton play that whole game. I'm not gonna do that again. Hey, listen to the guys in the stands, and that's where you end up being, or whatever. Hey, that's um, right. That's the saying. That's the saying. And I just, right. I just think you, it was an immature decision, based on emotion and based on uh, the narrative. Uh, great story. Game day came down. All that stuff. It was a great story, but he's got to coach a football team. He's not coaching a Disney movie, and you know it didn't work out. That it worked out terribly. So I, I've never. I don't think he fell prey to that stuff, I and mean, that's what we'll disagree on. I don't feel he fell, you know, fell prey to Holly Rose reporting and just the good vibes. I think he remembers what he saw when he played well, against good, that yeah, guy. That's a good point. And yeah, when he, he played saw against that, McKenzie Milton. And we also have to remember too, man, yeah. coming into that season, Jordan Travis was not like the paragon of, you know, of of health and vitality. Like right. he saw Jordan get knocked out of games a lot in 2020. 
and then in 2021, you know, the helmet comes off, he gets dinged up, and then, you know, maybe you're thinking, all right, like, I, I need someone I can rely on and, and, and go through a season with, and maybe this guy can finally do it for me. But, like, to your point, he'd been through enough practices to probably know that he didn't have that capability. But in the long. beauty, right, though, Aslan, is we saw all those practices. Yes. So I get it, too. Like, the guy, I'm telling you, folks, when you watch McKenzie Milton practice that season, it looked like. Uh, he was no more impressive than the fourth and fifth quarterbacks on the roster. It looked like a walk-on. It looked like a walk-on. And then he gets into the game against Notre Dame and looks like Doug Flutie, or looks like himself, looks like 2018 McKenzie Milton. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, good grief. And he did the same thing in the spring game. So I get the point of being, man, maybe he's just a guy that he's a gamer. When the lights come on, it's just different. He's one of these different dudes. And then, man, it's like, okay, the, the, once you get to halftime at Jacksonville State and you have one touchdown, that might be the time you're like, okay, the feel-good story is over. I need a quarterback that can – nothing else, we have to have a running game. This kid ran for over 100 yards against them last year. We put up 45 points on this team last year. I can't keep riding with this kid. I've got to go to Jordan Travis. I don't care if the fans boo him. But, you know, who, again, yeah, you're right, though. He had also seen the McKenzie Milton. He had lost to him. To, he lost to him in a championship game like 62 to 55. Yeah. So he had seen McKenzie Milton at the top, at the very pinnacle of the sport multiple times. And then he saw that fourth quarter. and He's like, well, geez, I guess he's back. Right. And it right. didn't work out that way. But again, I think more than anything, the story of that is, man, what a. What a mindset for Jordan Travis to have. And there are always times when Travis is still talking today where you can tell that still fuels him getting booed. Yeah. Like he still brings it up occasionally in a snide comment here or there. Not that he's making fun of the fans, but he all, he'll bring up occasionally, not every time. Like, yeah, man, I, you know, I, know what, I know what it's like for people not to believe in me. Or I've been booed at my, in my home stadium. Like that's always going to be in there with him. And instead of you know, knocking his legs out from under him, it somehow lifted him to become one of the best quarterbacks in the country. It's just a really cool story. Yeah. All right, let's take uh, one more. Uh, let's go to Bishop 1617. Uh, wake up, Corey and Aslan. Hope you both had fun on the fourth. Who are you picking to win the Major League Baseball home run derby? Mm. Is Pete Alonso in it? Yeah, he said he was going to enter it. Yeah. Well, that's the only thing the Mets ever win. So oh, hey. he'll, uh, he'll, uh, he'll, I'm sure he'll win that. I, I'll say this about Alonzo. He's a very good baseball player. Obviously, he, he might be a Hall of Famer. He gets, in my opinion, he gets way too excited about winning that thing. Hmm. He Every time, he's won it twice, he, and he always comes down to like the last, I guess it always would come down to the last swing. But when he hits it, he gets genuinely excited. Like he's just hit a walk-off home run. And it's like, all right, man, calm down. It's a, it's an exhibition home run derby. Yeah. You know, Ronald Acuna is twice the player you are. Oh, yeah. it, just because you beat him in a home run derby doesn't, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. It's cool. It's awesome. And I'm, and I'm glad he does it because I've been to one of those. In fact, I went to the Sammy Sosa home run derby in Atlanta. Ah. It, it was all unbelievable. And I was so mad going into that thing because Mark McGuire had gotten hurt the week before. So I was like, come on, man. Well, I'm not, all I wanted to do, we had tickets for it. I'm like, I'm going to get to see McGuire hit balls out of the stadium. And then, of course, he didn't make it. Barry Bonds, I don't think, participated in it. No, he didn't. So it was Griffey, which is Griffey. That's great. But he didn't hit like 480-foot home runs. He just had a beautiful swing that would hit him over the fence. And then Sosa comes. And, man, I will always be indebted to Sammy Sosa. I know he was a roided-up freak that was cheating and using a corked bat. But he was doing it for me. He was doing it for my entertainment and enjoyment, right, Aslan? Yep, yep. That's how I feel about it. So I guess in that sense, I'm glad Pete Alonso does do that. And he does put on a show, man. He, he does put on a show, and he's a great power hitter. He's an incredible power hitter. I just – it's it's a little odd how excited he gets about winning it yeah. because it's, you know, it's just a home run – it's just a home run derby. Like when Steph Curry won the three-point shootout, he didn't drop to a knee and kiss the court and, like, give a bunch of fist pumps or anything. I mean, he probably held his hand up. In like in the pose, but I mean, you know, just, but you know, Pete Alonso, hey, I take Pete Alonso on my, well, no, I wouldn't. I'd take Matt Olson over him, but that's just, hey, this ain't Braves. This ain't wake up Braves. Chop talk. <laughs> yeah, chop talk with Aslan and Corey. <laughs> uh, I'll go with like uh, Cecil Fielder, Jay Buhner. Are they in the, uh, the field? I think Fielder is. I think Buhner opted out because he's 53. Yeah. Uh, but I think, no, I think Cecil Fielder's dead, man. Maybe. 
Um, or did Prince? It, didn't Cecil Fielder pass away? Uh, now I feel terrible. Just trying to bring a little levity to the fact that God. Uh, I'll go with Randy Rosarena. I'll bet on my guy. Uh, Is he in it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, this weekend, uh, Steph and I are going down. To, the Braves are playing the Rays in Tampa. Ooh, nice. So we're going to go see a couple games down there in Tampa, which will be fun. Two, it might be a World Series preview, my man. Uh, Cecil Fielder is an American former baseball player. Oh, good. All right, <laughs> Cecil's around. That needs to be like a, a punchline for some stand-up. It's like when you look at Wikipedia and you see the was. Like, you see the past tense. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, James Gandolfini was an American actor. Yeah. Like, oh, dang, you know. Um, so, yeah, Cecil's alive and well. Um, yeah, uh, none of your bright uh, – Acuna's not doing it? No. Uh, no. Mookie Betts no, is doing it. No, he decided not to do it. Mookie What'd Betts. you say? Mookie Betts is in it. Uh, I'll root for Adley Rutschman and in, in, uh, Ira. How about that? There we go. That's who I'll pick. Ira's guy. Okay. But Alonzo's in it, right? Correct. Yes, he is. Alonzo's going to win it. He's built for it. He's. I mean, I don't <laughs> – He is like 45 him. every time he does it. Yeah. He does put on a show. I've seen him take batting practice. Before I even knew who he was, I remember this. I was at a Braves-Mets game. We got there early because Bra- Brady was walking the field. His team, his little, little league thing – his little league uh, organization got to walk the field before the game. So we're there for batting practice, and there's this dude hitting bombs over the trees in center field. And I'm like, what in the world is this? Yeah. And I, I, I took a picture of him because I didn't know who it was. This was Alonzo's rookie year. And I texted it to Tom Lang, War Chance owned, because he's a big Mets fan. I'm like, who would this guy be that was hitting the ball 500 feet in batting practice? He goes, oh, that was probably Alonzo. And sure enough, that night, Alonzo hit one to dead center that went like 480. Sorry, I sounded like I was. I didn't appreciate his skills. He's very. He's a very good baseball player, and he is fun to watch. He's fun to watch hit the ball. Should have been a knoll. I think apparently he said like in some live in-game interview during spring training once that he wanted to go to Florida State. And do you remember the story where he got made fun? He it was some like he came out against the culture of Florida baseball because he had like a, a long distance girlfriend it's a bizarre story it was an huh. ESPN story huh. like a like a one of their uh not 30 for 30s but the ESPN 60 story yeah, yeah. about E60. how he E60. yeah E60 yeah. like how he felt bullied on his own Florida baseball team because they made fun of him having a long distance girlfriend huh. something really bizarre so anyway those people. I hope he's I hope he's happy Pete I hope you're happy man I know you're a big listener yeah. I hope you're happy and uh good luck at the home run derby go Tigers uh, as well so all right that's a wrap for us we'll do one more show for you folks tomorrow uh, stay connected to warchant.com the ultimate symbol sports source jeff cameron show one to three o'clock 93 3 fm as well as warchant tv subscribe to warchant tv it's totally free hit the thumbs up five star ratings and reviews he's Corey. i'm aslan thanks for listening to wake up warchant presented by the corner pocket bar and grill